So hey, I'm Langston Wilkins with Humanities Washington. We're a nonprofit whose mission is to open minds and bridge divides by creating spaces to explore different perspectives. And we hold hundreds of events around the state each year, and you can check out our work at humanities.org. Now today we're here to talk about the relationship between sports and protest. And this is a topic that has recently been in vogue due to the Milwaukee Bucks pro basketball team choosing not to take the court or play in a playoff game to protest police violence against black people and also in support of the larger Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, this move came in the wake of Jacob Blake's murder in Wisconsin, the ongoing quest for justice for Breonna Taylor and other similar tragedies. And the Bucks actions triggered short-term work stoppages or strikes across the NBA, as well as other leagues like the Women's National Basketball Association, or WNBA, Major League Baseball, and Major League Soccer. Now, taking a step back from the particular moment, the WNBA had already dedicated their entire season to social justice. And both the NBA and Major League Baseball have shown support for Black Lives Matter through marketing and on-the-field imagery since they returned to play from um, COVID-19 stoppage. And of course, NFL quarterback Colin Kaepernick's refusal to stand for the national anthem in protest of police violence has been one of the biggest stories in sports the last several years. Now, I must admit that despite teams and leagues making public statements in support of Black Lives Matter, I was personally surprised to see an even, uh, even a brief work strike, stoppage, excuse me. And these actions have triggered complex responses from the public. Some people support the strike and social justice initiatives, and others feel that sports is not the appropriate venue for protest. Um, keep politics out of sports, you'll hear them say. Now this relationship between sports, protests, and Black Lives Matter is intricate and complex, and we're gonna grapple with it in the following discussion. And we're here with two wonderful, amazing panelists, uh, Professor E. Eric Davis and Professor Latoya T. Brackett, and I'll let them introduce themselves, starting with Professor Brackett. Thanks so much, Langston. I'm really glad to be here today. Uh, my name is Dr. Latoya Brackett, and I am an assistant professor of African American Studies at the University of Puget Sound. I'm also a leadership team member of the Race and Pedagogy Institute. Um, I do popular culture, and I've written an article about uh, Colin Kaepernick a couple years ago, and I was like, oh, gotta go revisit some things, and just a recent book cha uh, chapter in a book called Playing on the uh, an, in an Uneven Field, talking about NFL and NBA, and the white gaze that polices them. So I'm really excited to actually just have this conversation. Somebody that can just talk about this for a minute with me. So I'm excited to hear what my colleagues on the panel have to say. And I'll pass it over to Professor Davis. Hey, good afternoon, folks. And thank you, Langston, again, and Dr. Brackett for the opportunity to share some time. And uh, for those watching, appreciate you all as well for taking the time to spend time with us. Um, my name is Professor E. Eric Davis, and I just go by Professor E. often with my students at Bellevue College. Um, I teach sociology and in the ethnic studies department. Uh, courses include sociology of sport, a, a course on race and sports and the intersection of those things. And in addition, I um, uh, have served in the uh, Humanities Washington the last year and a half uh, for a Smithsonian exhibit on sports and the impact of sports in our communities, um, hometown teams. And so uh, that uh, exhibit was paused because of COVID, but that will be returning to uh, some areas right here in the Puget Sound and throughout the state. So hopefully folks get a chance to check that out. And then lastly, I think, and just a notion of relevance, um, you know, I'm a former student athlete and I also had the opportunity to work in an athletic department. Um, and so, you know, having a little bit of experience in all those areas, um, uh, Hopefully, we'll add something to the conversation. Thank you for again for the opportunity. Thank you both. Thank you both. And so, as a jumping-off point, uh, I want to start with this particular moment. So, what moved the Milwaukee Bucks and the larger NBA to strike in protest of police violence? You know, um, there's been several, many high-profile um, police incidents over the last several years. Again, Kyler Kaepernick has been a story for many years. So what prompted this particular move right now? Why now? Okay. I can give a quick response of COVID-19. <laughs> um, <Absolutely. laughs> 
everybody's talking about the two pandemics. It's like, well, we've been in one for 401 years, which is the black pand- the, the you know, the violence against black against black bodies. But I would say that COVID is really um, the foundation to the visibility, also the extra hyper visibility. We're getting back into sports. We were done with sports for a while. People are paying more attention, and sports are a very American thing. And this is like those couple of steps into saying, oh, we might be just right there back. And then they're like, hold, COVID may seem like it's going away, but there's another pandemic we need to pay attention to. And so I wanted to bring that into the space. Um, That's kind of what, if just like my blatant direct answer to that, it's COVID-19, it's the two pandemics we've got going on and visibility, the hyper visibility of sports right now. And And I couldn't concur any stronger than that literally on my notes, I wrote COVID, that was it. And, and the reason that is, I think that my colleague has already illustrated a little bit, but let me add on. And that is the fact that um, what, what, you know, what do we do when we don't have sports? Sports is both an outlet for us to relieve our stress. Sports is a way for us to uh, zone out. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? It's a way for us to relieve kind of anxieties and stresses of the everyday work week. Well, when you don't work and you don't have work because of things like the COVID pandemic, you end up with nothing to watch, nothing to, uh, you know, kind of take away from the day-to-day grind. And on top of it, um, you know, we see these athletes have to debate whether or not it's safe to play. College athletes have already made that call on a lot of levels with the Pac-12 players coming together and saying, these are the things that we need in order to make us feel safe to play. So you add all that together. And the only thing I would add to it is really, I think folks here, uh, those hopefully folks across the country may get a chance to check this out. But within the space that we live in, in the space of Humanities Washington, here in the Northwest, um, we don't really understand the depths of the African-American population in that region. Um, Milwaukee is somewhere close to 40% African-American and Kenosha is right there. Uh, actually, I think it's like, a, you know, 38% black in Milwaukee, Chicago is just south of Kenosha and that's 30% African-American. And you have a a 12% black population in Kenosha itself. And so here in the state of Washington, where we're 7% black in the city of Seattle and 4% in the state, um, I think folks may not understand that there is a strong, vibrant, active black community in the Midwest in that space. And uh, I think that the Milwaukee Bucks um, live and work and play in that space. And so it goes, I think it's a, a natural... Um, it just kind of follows, right? It just kind of follows. No, thank you. That that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm wondering why the NBA? You know, is there something about the makeup or culture of the NBA that um, created this moment that uh, allowed the Milwaukee, the Milwaukee Bucks to step out in that way, in ways that um, we haven't seen from other leagues and other teams? I'm just wondering about if the NBA's culture contributed to this, to this particular moment? Well, I'll, I'll start on this one and then pass it off to you, Dr. Brackett. But um, it, it's, the NBA is, is right around 80%. And I'm throwing a lot of numbers out there for folks, but just to help you to understand the context. Whereas the NFL is about 60%, 63% on any given Sunday. And the Major League Baseball and, and other sports, it really drops after that. And so, the, the NBA and the WNBA is a strong African-American centered league. Um, those leagues are very centered in the black experience. And so it doesn't surprise me at all that they would be taking a much more quote unquote air quoted aggressive stance. And I put the air quotes around it for all of those out there who would say that they were making some kind of microaggressive notions around black folks and aggression. Um, I'm not one for that, but I'll just go ahead and acknowledge those that might be catching that in the audience. Look, I think that personally as a black man in society, I am absolutely sick and tired of seeing us get shot. I'm sick and tired of having to protest. I'm sick and tired of having to wear Black Lives Matter shirts to tell you and convince you that I matter. 
And so I thank goodness for the guys and the, and the men and women of the NBA, WNBA for taking a strong stance and that their culture allowed them to step up and say, that's not, that's, that's enough. And the WNBA, by, you, by the way, was is probably the more strong voice on this consistently. Um, they have been wearing shirts and putting things out there consistently. And so I think the sisters kind of took um, even, you know, kind of led the way on this one. And, you know, um, I'm glad that the African-American um, and the league itself in the NBA uh, followed suit. But, um, you know, I, you know uh, help me out here. Uh, what, what, where did you go from there? Well, I'll go back to what you said at the beginning, which is the numbers, right? Um, I'll never forget looking at the, the numbers, the data of how many black bodies are making up NBA, right? And then even the NFL, right? Because you say it just drops off. But, and then we get up the ranks to there's actually some black leadership in the NBA yes. where we're seeing like nothing in the NFL. And there's some data on one of my, in my, in my book chapter, where I did a little chart there. And I was like, this is, this is problematic. Uh, and that also tells you something. And then one of the things I would say about the numbers speaks to a collective ability to be able to go out there collectively. And so we've seen some protests like this before and people don't recall a lot of them because a lot of times it's one person. So even Kaepernick was basically by himself, right? There was no plan. There was no, no already discussion. Shirts already had been worn before it was just him. But then um, in 1990s, um, uh, Mahmoud abdul Rauf. Uh, Denver Nuggets, you know, uh, I wanted to make sure I looked up his name and got it right. Uh, he, you know, he, in his own prayer, was protesting, you know, during the national anthem. And, you know, his, of course, he wasn't a big name either. Like, he wasn't some huge name that people were going to follow along and try to listen to. But even with Kaepernick being a successful, you know, quarterback, which is also breaking the rules in itself, being a Black quarterback, he was heard but not. So one of the things I would say is, like, this collective ability to work together and it brings me back to outside of the NBA, but back into college, right? Let's go back to 2015 when Mizzou, right. the football team took, they supported the one, the group of black students, the students, the grad student um, that went on a hunger strike because of the issues happening at, um, at Mizzou, University of Missouri, uh, in regards to race relations. And they said, you know what, the black, the black athletes said, you know what, well, we stand with them because they said something along any uh, 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 MLK quote, injustice anywhere is injustice for all or whatever so basically we are if it's happening to my brothers and sisters who are not athletes it's happening to us as well which is a divide that i think eric and I, you and i could probably talk about that as uh, being in higher ed and you also being in that having done been in the athletics department as well seeing it and so when they said collectively we're not going to do this and then their coach said you know what all right cool and then the whole team black white everybody said we won't two days later they asked that the president either get fired or resign. Two days later, the president resigns. Mm -hmm. And so I think that this collective component is what's also key in the NBA because of the feeling of a team and the numbers of who's on a NBA, who's on an NBA team versus how many people are on a, on a football team, right? Also, like, and then playing together and not one side, the other side, you know, offense. It's, there's a difference in what basketball as a game does. I also think that even just the fact of the court versus a field, I think that there's so many levels to this. And then having some major leaderships, leadership like LeBron James, where it's literally, hey, this man has put his money where his mouth is. He's been doing the work consistently. And the reality is without those folks who had to play the role, play the part before him, he would not have had this, this extra bit of freedom. And they're like, hey, we're at this point, let's do this collectively. And the fact that the teams, the, the players themselves are having this conversation about what to do. And I think this goes even more so to show why the WNBA is so successful and consistent with this because they are women and they have that additional oppression, right? And so people aren't paying attention to them. I looked at a video earlier and someone says, I'm not trying to be rude or not. I didn't even know that the WNBA was having a season right now. <laughs> and I was like, wow. But that's, that's the reality. They are already invisible. And they are already collective because of that visibility of being women athletes, mm -hmm. you know, always got to have the W in front of it. If you say basketball, you got to make sure you say women's first so they know which one you're talking about because basketball by default is men's. That's why I think that they've always been consistent in this fight because they're already fighting, right? And, uh, and yeah, I guess I'll kind of leave it at that. I think it's the collective. I think it's the numbers. I think it's the kind of sport that it is. I think there's a, there's so many things about what you can get from basketball that you can't get from football, right? 
in regards to engagement, um, you know, individual play and style, all that stuff. So yeah, that's what I would throw back onto what Eric started off with, which was the numbers. Yeah, and you know, I would uh, just add a little note because the 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 Missouri story from 2015 is is of note uh, because the swiftness by which you know the uh, board of trustees said, okay, if you all you all are not going to play next week if we don't do this, well, let's make this happen right now. And but but I was uh, when I was teaching sociology of sport a couple of years ago, one of my students brought me brought it to my attention something that I thought was interesting, and they said that. The year prior to that protest, Michael Sam was the defensive player of the year for the SEC, which is the biggest football conference there is. Now, for those who don't know, Michael Sam was the uh, uh, NFL player who was the first out gay male to um, before he uh, retired from the league. And, you know, we have put people come out of the closet or come out in general um, when they are you know, retired, but Michael Sam came out and said, I'm gay before he even kissed his boyfriend on, you know, on the, you know, on the television uh, in front of us um, when he was announced that he was drafted. Well, the interesting thing of this is that, think about it, the Missouri football team, many of those players who ended up protesting in 2015 were teammates with Michael Sam and his courageous efforts and his um, protest really to me strong voice and strong stance and standing up for himself and all others who um, identify as accordingly that to me set the tone for that uh, next year I think that that his teammates knew that he was gay they supported him they learned and came through it themselves they had to understand their own issues and biases and all of that I think helped propel um, that the Missouri, Missouri football team was primed and ready. And so going back to your question, Langston, I think that the NBA and uh, kind of a long legacy of this stuff in history, um, LeBron James as the identified superstar for that league, uh, being so active and engaged in any community he's lived in, um, all of that came together uh, to create um, a perfect opportunity to uh, stand up. Um, and, and we already said COVID, made it hyper um, active and sensitive and brought visibility at a whole nother level. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, I'm glad you brought us back a bit into recent history um, because some people feel that the, I guess, political athlete is a new idea that sports has only recently oh, no. become a platform for protest. Um, but that's obviously not true. Right. Um, so can you, Walk us through a bit of that history. How have athletes used their platform to protest injustice, you know, across history? <laughs> well, I, I have a, a list that I kind of go through in my chapter. I, you know, I, I definitely cover, I go all, all the way back to Jack Johnson, you know, and the great white, <laughs> the great white hope <laughs> or hype as that movie that came out accurately portrayed it. But, you know, and then the riots that come after um, this black man in the early 1900s being able to beat um, a white man that they pulled out of retirement in hopes that he would be able to get back this, this heavyweight title, boxing title, because the black man can't have it. And Jack Johnson, I mean, that's a very interesting guy. And he, and I think this alludes to what, it goes back to what Eric was saying about um, uh, Michael Sam in that his protest was being himself. And uh, of all people, Jack Johnson was very much always himself. He was a very unique guy and they didn't like that. And, and I wanna say they, I, I mean, white American society didn't like that and they policed him for that and they tried everything they could. But the fact that he kept fighting was one of those. You got 1936, you got Jesse Owens going to Germany, right? In, <laughs> in a time that we we're like, do we go, do we not go? Do we, you know, cause it's under the Nazi rule. And they wanted to make sure Aryan people were the only ones on Germans, you know, uh, Olympic stands to, to be able to beat everybody else. And Jesse Owens, even African-Americans here were like, dude, why are you going? What you doing? We even had our own concerns about this black man going there and, and fighting for an American society that still didn't treat us any better than what we saw was happening in Germany. Uh, we got, you know, so I, I mean, and then we have, you know, um, Muhammad Ali, you know, by himself saying, I, you know, I'm not going to be drafted. I don't, I don't support this war. And them stripping him of everything they can. Um, you know, those are, and then, I, you know, of course, Jackie Robinson, 
who we don't know the narrative of him when he was in the military, he protests in the military. He actually um, made changes and strides in the military for, Af for African-American um, um, men. And, uh, but when he became drafted, he had to be a different type of protest, which is just, is, it, the reality is as African-Americans, us being on a team in itself that was not yet integrated is protest, right? Um, and I think uh, when I was writing my chapter, I was talking about how NFL and NBA, we don't really pay as much attention to how they were integrated because there's not really like one, there's not this just like this one solid story. There's more, you know, they're all kind of go. And then also the, the way in which we integrate those sports and also lose our, our capital, our, our economic capital as African-Americans um, in so many ways as well. And I, I know we're gonna get to that conversation about capital. <laughs> in this because we've already touched on a little bit but those are a couple of things that i think you know really hit home um that can cover i was like what okay history that's a lot let's try to get a couple in there real quick and make sure we all know who to look up and when we get off of this call but i'll pass it back to eric for uh, any additional um uh, um um stories narratives that would be pertinent to this history of protest which is if we're there we're protesting because american society told us we should not supposed to be there yeah, I think that's a fantastic listen. I would go back to exactly the same starting point. Uh, the only additions I would put in there is uh, in connection to this Milwaukee Bucks story specifically is uh, Bill Russell. Um, and Bill Russell in the early NBA um, often would have N N NAACP banners right behind him as he stood in protest. Um, he and other N NBA stars sat side by side with Muhammad Ali um, when he said, I'm not doing this anymore. You know, Jim Brown from the NFL, of course, was in the mix as well. And so you got this history that not a lot of people um, pay attention to. Um, and it's not as if you have to take a class to know it. You just have to kind of pay attention to sports history to understand that the Althea Gibsons and, um, uh, you know, folks outside of the African-American spectrum, but perhaps, you know, Billie Jean King um, asserting uh, around gender um, and making sure that, you know, we understand that, you know, this notion of the platform of sports and particularly the popularity of it gives rise to opportunity. And um, I, again, appreciate and, and really, really thank the, the, the many players across history, but in current times that stepped up and used that platform um, so that my children um, can see and that the children of this country and the world can see that, you know, they understand. You know, I heard these things about these rich guys have a lot of nerve um, standing up in protest. Uh, as if somehow uh, their economic affluence or their opportunities or their earned privilege is something that should be used against them. Um, and that's something so outside of what would happen in white America. It's interesting that we always end up back there. It's as if somehow you lose your voice just because, well, I guess, shut up and play football, shut up and bounce the ball, entertain us. But on an everyday basis, we might find ourselves in a situation where uh, a, a, an unfortunate shooting happens and we're going to do all we can to justify it or explain it away. And the consistency by which we see this in our society, we have to continue to center it. This is about black bodies, unarmed black bodies, men in particular, black men being shot. And with Jacob Blake, you're talking about at point blank range, seven to the back in front of three children. It is so unacceptable that um, I think another answer to the question earlier is that I think that for all of us, it just became clear. It's so unacceptable that this is it. That's enough. Um, we've been through the Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and so many more through, during this COVID window um, that it, it's just so insulting to think that somehow because you have uh, worked hard and earned the opportunity uh, to to perform at the highest level as an athlete that you don't have a voice and that you're still not a black man or a black woman in the society and aren't still subjected to all kind of uh, discriminatory behaviors and institutional racism. And let's make sure we call that out too. It's institutionalized, folks. Uh, this is not some personal thing. This is a continuation of uh, permanence with regard to racism in our country. And until we face that, um, I'm glad that we're protesting it, but until we face the deeper story, um, we're going to have to keep 
having these conversations and protesting. And I'll leave it there. No, thank you, thank you. And you know, you all, both of you, just named some of the greatest athletes in the history of sport. Um, and I would also, you know, put LeBron James in there as well. But that, that makes me wonder about a figure like Michael Jordan, who, according to popular narrative, uh, was famously um, non-political. I mean, we all know the, the Republicans buy sneakers too comment and, and things like that. So I'm just wondering how we understand um, a figure like Michael Jordan in the context of this pantheon of, you know, legendary Black athletes who, who you know, were willing to sacrifice, you know, in terms of a poor political movements. How do we understand Michael Jordan in that context? This one. I, I, I'd like to start on this one. Um, I would have loved for Michael Jordan to support the Democratic candidate in North Carolina and would have loved to have seen him use his platform in a different way. That being said, would I ever want someone to put it upon me that just because of the role I play or the thing I do for my, uh, you know, uh, that I do for a living is such that I have to um, be the voice? I would have loved to see him do it. I'll just say that again. I would have loved to. Um, I would have loved to see that um, opportunity being just grasped that, that opportunity. Um, but Michael Jordan, if you've seen the, the documentary that apparently a lot of people watched during COVID, um, was a hyper competitive guy and still is, and um, is a pure athlete, I guess you would say, and was going to stay apolitical in the name of, of, of earning a, a ton of money. And this may be a stretch. And so please, either one of y'all have permission, because I might be just playing the devil's advocate here. So please just go ahead and clown me if it becomes necessary. But this, Michael Jordan has shoes that people will go out and pay $250, $300, $400 for. Now, I'm not saying that the same, it's the same level of protest, but boy, he's got them. He's got people. He's got them lining up. And white America, you're buying his shoes. You're putting economic power in the hands of a, of a black man. And in a certain way, to me, that is in itself a kind of a, a, a certain level, I won't call it protest, but a certain level of authority, power, uh, influence, maybe. Um, and so I'm not one personally and professionally to say that this should be the expectation of all of us in the African-American diaspora that we should all uh, make uh, speak up. Or maybe I should say it this way, we should all speak up, but we all have the right to speak up in the ways that we see as appropriate. We should all assert our power in the ways we see it um, most um, effective. And, uh, and, and, and I, you know, I'll go back to the history of, of, of African-American um, you know, political thought. You, know, you had the Du Bois and the Booker T. Washington debates. You had the Malcolm X and Martin Luther King debates. And those playing off of the different ways you can look at it allows us to be um, a wider ranging um, group of people. We always get monolithically put into a box as, as one black thought. And so I, I give Michael Jordan uh, his opportunity to say, that's not me, that's not how I'm gonna do it. Um, but boy, I would have loved it. <laughs> I would have loved to see him do more uh, because he's a, still a megastar, still a megastar. So you can convince to go in and clown me now, it's okay. <laughs> I won't clown you because you're right that African Americans, we don't all think alike. We don't all act the same way. And the reality is it's the white gaze that tell people otherwise. Yeah. They, that tells people that we're only one thing. Um, so, you know, it's hard to be a black person that's different, different <laughs> to the white gaze because we know that there's so many of us. I think that when it comes to Jordan, I would love to, I, I haven't, haven't been able to watch the uh, the documentary because I've been it's been a busy summer for black studies professors, <laughs> specifically black black studies professors. Let me think of that. But it's been really busy. But I would say I would love to have a conversation one on one with him now yeah. um, because he can look back. There's hindsight. And it may not be that, you know, we I think we all I hope that everybody feels the same way that I do about my personal life. I've had some really bad things happen, but I wouldn't go back and change them. I don't know if he would say that he would change them, but I wonder if he can look hindsight and say, yeah, you know, that could have been a different, I could have did a different take. I could have vocalized why I could have did, you know, something different, but I'd like to have that conversation with him one-on-one -on -one without a camera 
and and hear what he's what he's dealing with at this point. Um, and I only say that because we, Eric's right. We can't expect every black person to be the voice of Black America. It's because white society tells us that they must be, um, that we are expecting that also. So we, as African Americans, who are expecting more of every individual African American black person out there that's on some platform the reality is we've been trained to believe that that's the way it's gonna be. Um, and I would say that um, money and the white gaze. So as much as Jordan's shoes are giving him money, white people are okay with us giving him money because they like him. Uh, yep, right. He is the Jordan, that, he is the player they like. He's the already shut up and dribble, mm -hmm. right? That LeBron James is not. But would LeBron James be LeBron James without Jordan? Because then it gets to this point, and this is where Eric talks about the difference, you know, the schools of thought of Du Bois and Booker T. If there was one, not one or the other, we, where would we have gone? Same with Malcolm X and Martin, because they're like, oh, the white gaze wants Martin so we can beat up on people. And that's where all the violence is really coming from, white people beating up on the people that say they won't fight back versus leaving Malcolm alone, never really engaged with him physically, because they're like, we already know, but saying that something's wrong with Malcolm and saying the lesser of the two evils, well, the white folks saying, we'll go with this one. So if we don't have both of the, you know, one or the other, we, we don't really move forward. And I think you can see that throughout African-American history, no matter what. Um, there is a white gaze that tells us they have to make the choice and they decide which one they're gonna side with at that time. And then that, the next time. And then at the next time, and I think we're at the next time right now. This is that moment where we're saying, okay, white folks, what's what's going on now? Which Where are you moving forward, right? Which side are you gonna take on this one? And so, um, and then of course we can have a lot more debates about Jordan and African-Americans who, you know, buying his shoes and, and then the harm, you know, the economic pitfalls of African-Americans having to buy his shoes and whatever, you know, but I do know that in the last couple of, like the last decade, he has been putting more of his money where his mouth is, but he's still trying his best not to say race. You know, I know he did something for low-income folks at one point. I was like, all right, Jordan, I see you. But he also tried to, I don't know all the ins and outs of this, but he tried to be an owner, I believe, of the Wizards or something like that, and that wasn't work. It, it, he's also having to look back like, oh, I thought I did everything right, but I'm still Black in America. I think that there's some really important notions of understanding that, and this goes back to what Eric said earlier, when LeBron James walks off that court and takes off that uniform, he's still a black man. Eric can attest to this as a professor. He's still a black man in that story that's followed. I'm an African-American woman. I'm still a black woman being followed or being harassed. It doesn't matter our credentials. It's Henry Louis Gates on his own lawn getting policed because you're still black in America. It doesn't matter how much money you make when you're black. It doesn't go the same way. So even if they shut up and dribble, their body is political, right? Our bodies are political, period. And you have us all in this court, playing this game, doing as you say, changing the rules. I mean, and then, oh, and then the other protest that I would say that we missed, and Eric, you'll be like, yep, we forgot that one, especially since it's Midwest, is the Fab Five. Yeah. And the financial gain that you Mish got from them and win basketball, uh, specifically college basketball goes woo like everybody's like oh this is a money maker which allows for Mizzou years later to say nah we ain't playing oh we need that money so there's so many levels to this where the Fab Five weren't able to be as successful as Mizzou was but they had to come first to get to where we are now and I think that that's a lot of what our history resides in and and I give props to Jordan and the fact that he's lived his life and if he the fact that he was able to make that decision is a power that a lot of people don't get to have or feel that they have. And that I give them kudos to that. Whether I would do it is not, it's not my place to say, right? I think that we have to recognize that we're all individuals and that's the difficulty here. We're all individuals, but, right? <laughs> or we're all individuals and we have to do, why do we always have to do it? Because we're in a, in a, um, a white society that there's institutionalized racism as, you know, that makes us have to be perfect all the time. There is no mediocrity in black culture is what I say. In black people, there is no mediocrity. We're not allowed to just show up. We have to show up and show out in the way that white people want. But we could also show out the other ways too. So I, I ain't gonna clown on you. I thought that was really great. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> Appreciate it.
Uh, and that's a perfect segue into a larger conversation about uh, commerce, economics, and protests. Um, because we've seen, even recently, sportswear brands like Nike um, expressing outward support for Black Lives Matter. Um, Colin Kaepernick, they featured, in a, featured him in commercials. Um, I recently saw that the Miami Heat have a, a branded, uh, like branded Black Lives Matter gear that they're selling on their website. So I'm wondering, um, like, what are the ramifications of this? Um, how does this commercialization help or hurt or complicate the movement against police violence and um, in support of Black lives? Well, popular culture in general has always uh, kind of had the ability to shape the conversation and, the, and, the, and shape the cultural narrative around this stuff. And so um, whether it be hip hop music and uh, African-American dominance when it comes to popular music in general, a lot of folks don't realize that hip hop music is the latest area of dominance when it comes to black music. Um, going back prior to Motown, for those who would say, well, you're talking about Motown? Nope, prior to that, you're talking about jazz and, and spirituals and the blues, uh, where they wouldn't even put the brother's uh, picture on the cover of the album because they didn't want folks to not buy it. Uh, so you have this long history of, of musical and pop culture within the realm of music being a, 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 a source of uh, our voice, our ability to speak. Um, and, and, and song and, 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 and music, if you talk about jazz, for instance, uh, where there's no lyrical content. And, and so pop culture has always had that ability and been a tool for the black community. And in the same way now, you see sports and um, with particularly NBA, NFL, and those are the big money makers in this country and worldwide, I would argue. Um, those two, um, and I would say soccer as well in some levels, um, baseball, the America's pastime. You have a lot of people over the course of history and in current times who use their sports platform to, um, you know, in the name of popular culture. And so to the point of the, the ramifications of it, you know, um, money talks. Latoya said that, you know, money talks. And um, people, uh, you know, their value system in sociology, we talk about if you want to know where people's values are, see where they're spending their money. Um, and we spend a lot of money on sports and we spend a lot of money um, engaging in um, the paraphernalia associated with sports and buying the jerseys and the hats and all of that stuff. And so I think that in a capitalist society and as strong as we are in the name of capitalism here in the U.S., uh, to have that platform based on an economic principle or a Nike corporation, man, Nike's just doing what Nike does. Um, uh, this is my critique of, 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 of social services, higher education, and others, is that in my consulting work and working with your corporations, when Ford Motor Company, Nike Corporation, when they see a, a COVID situation, they pivot quick. They're like, here's the moment, we're gonna pivot and take advantage of it. Take advantage of it, not in a necessarily a negative way, but this is where people are, so we're gonna speak to where people are. Sometimes within my own space, I won't talk about other places, but in my own space, Bellevue College and other places I've worked, the, the, the movement to diversity, equity, inclusion is often delayed because we want to talk about it and commiserate over it, and we don't necessarily pivot quickly. And so I think that some of us in the social services and higher education, and it's not just my school or the schools I've been affiliated with over my career. This is all schools. We are just slow to move. And so Nike, we could say, well, how dare they bring up and use this moment and these black protests to make money. That's what Nike does. They make money and they're consistent about it. In the same way, I, I wonder how we in higher education, in social services, in nonprofits, what do we need to do to think and, and, and be quick on our feet, quick in, our, our, uh, in, in rolling in and saying to situations like this, it's time to pivot and quickly make a move. And so that's the takeaway I get from it. Um, to me, the, to, to summarize it in the most simplest terms, Langston, it's 
they're a commercial corporate entity. That's what they do. They're being completely consistent. It's those of us who uh, want to debate it and talk about it and write white papers on it before we change the policy um, that I worry about a little bit more. But I don't know, uh, Latoya, what do you say to that? I think you, I mean, the last 30 seconds is all we probably had to say is that they are a corporation and Nike has its own issues of operations and exploitation that I, I'm not even gonna go down there. And then I think when, when, they, when um, Colin Kaepernick was signed on to Nike, we had our people being like, oh, he should have did that because Nike this and da, 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 da. I was just like, you know what? I, I got nothing on that. I, I'm just like, he's been putting money where his mouth is for the last couple of years by giving to organizations that do this work of social justice. And that's what he's been doing. That's been his job. And then he gets this, you know, he gets this Nike commercial. I feel like that's when around the time that they were like, oh, come back and do a, a uh, the NFL was like, hey, let's see a tryout or something. And then they didn't do anything with that. And that just fell down the, you know, that fell, just fell out of our, our uh, purview there. But I want to go, I want to talk about in a different way about Nike um, and about, um, you know, jerseys and this pop culture narrative that Eric is talking about. And the fact that when Kaepernick sat down, people were burning his jerseys, huh. effigies of him, dragging his body behind a truck, having his head dangling from behind, you know, that, and then with his jerk, like burning the number seven. And I was like, man, I didn't even get mine, but you'd go buy a hundred and something dollar jersey or you had it before he sits down or kneels and now you want to burn it. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And then I loved it though, when the Nike commercial came out with Kaepernick, all of our lovely, <laughs> non-supportive Kaepernick fans were burning and tearing up their Nike shoes. And I don't know if y'all remember that. Everybody was throwing away their Nikes. I'm not wearing Nike anymore. And da, 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 da. And then they were like, I'm just going to wear my Chuck Taylors. And I'm sitting here like, Nike owns Converse. <laughs> Which also speaks to this idea of perception and what you show. Because if we think about how many corporations own just about, there's like several corporations that own just a, about everything. Right. And so if you're trying to boycott one, you better be boycott, you better recognize all of them and connected. And I thought that was so interestingly hilarious that you're saying you're going to boycott Nike, but you're over there and then say you're going to use these shoes instead. Same company, you know, Nike ID, you know. So that was interesting. And then additionally, um, in the summer of Black liberation, of racial justice issues, we get finally the Washington team, I will not say their name, the NFL Washington team. Thank you. To get rid of their slur as their name. Mm -hmm. And how did they do that? It was the money, it was the advertisers that said, we're pulling out. So Nike, from what I recall, pulled down the jerseys off of their website um, because they weren't gonna support having that racial slur anymore. And this was the time that Nike pivot. I liked how you said that, Eric. They pivoted like, let's just do this real quick. And but also it's financial too, because if <laughs> if the team that changes its name, Nike has to be a part of that, they could probably still sell those old ones in some other capacity that we won't know about <laughs> until like years later. And then FedEx, which owns the 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 stadium that has the emblem around the stadium, said, Nope. And then now we have the Washington team in flux. And I think they then hired. Um, a former African-American player to be up in the ranks of like diversity inclusion or something like that to talk about what this name is going to be. Um, and so there is a space for corporations to make a nudge because money still does talk. So I wanted to add that additional narrative of where we have seen some unique individual interactions with this, people burning stuff, and then the ways in which corporations are like, you know what, we're kind of at that point too where we don't want to be having, you know, a racist slur against the peoples whose land we reside on, you know? So we're gonna, we're gonna push that too. So I think that that was an interesting moment. And I remember some of my native friends were like, hey, go change that name. And I'm not saying I told you so because we have no idea what's next <laughs> with that. But just, just that does matter because sports does matter. Pop culture does matter. Wearing a jersey and believing that you can't say the name on the jersey, but you can wear it. So yeah, so that's where I'd be with, with the economic situations on that for sure. Yeah, just a quick uh, that, that is that is uh, that was brilliant. I, I appreciate that notion because I think that that the Washington football team angle to this um, uh, because what is important for folks to realize here is that um, this Black Lives Matter movement 
and the NBA stars uh, and WNBA stars and others in other sports standing up for um, social justice um, has spread, right? It's not just an African-American conversation. It's spread to the Washington football team. It's spread to um, all the different ways in which gender and identity and sexual identity and folks are just saying enough's enough. We're not doing this anymore. And they're, they're, they're doing that because they're realizing that you know, hey, if those guys were willing to stand up and if those women were willing to stand up um, in the name of Black Lives and in support of Jacob Blake, then um, it's just created this interesting dynamic of, by which we're just continuing to uh, move past uh, institutionalized racism in this country and moving past institutionalized discriminatory behaviors and starting to look ourselves in the mirror and say, that's not okay. And people who swore they would never change a name Swore, never, ever. The name is now being changed. And, um, you know, the ripple effect has been fantastic. Wow. I don't know what to say. Brilliant, <laughs> brilliant. Um, to, to round out the discussion, so we have striking teams. We have um, Black Lives Matter branded on NBA courts and on MLB mounds. We have corporate investment and engagement in Black Lives Matter. Does all of this suggest more acceptance and support for Black Lives Matter and racial struggle amongst a larger um, and general population? Or what does this mean for the larger movement? Just wonder. I think it's, we usually, well, in our history, African-Americans gain freedom from a force of the government, right? We get voting rights from the force of the government with a pen. And in this case, we're not getting any legislation that's gonna tell us that black, you know, anything different, but perhaps this forced narrative in a way, because we talked at the beginning about, this is a basketball, you know, um, sports are an American thing. This is our pastime. Um, and it's the only one, we're the only nation in the world that plays our national anthem before every game. Nobody else does that. We do that. Um, even the history of the national anthem itself, which was originally a war, um, a war song, right? Um, so literally linked to military and then the so association then with the flag and the military and standing. And then if you don't stand, then you're, you're disrespecting our troops. All of that is wrapped up in this. And now you're being forced to see that um, in an enclosed arena where people can't really come in and protest it, like the audience can't come in and, and dissent against it, this is all you're going to see are these words, Black Lives Matter, all these things on people's jerseys. Is it performative? Yeah. I mean, we, I think we all are kind of like, oh, I don't know about this. I don't know about having that on the back of your jersey. I don't know about it written across the floor. I don't, I don't know, but, but you know what? If people are watching who usually tell people to shut up and dribble or only thinking that basketball, oh, it's colorblind, like I don't see race in my players, but my favorite player is a black person, but the moment that they decide to say something, I'm gonna go and burn their jersey, perhaps they have to be reminded that your player is black. Your players are black. And their teammates who are not black are supporting them too, because they realize like, yeah, this is most of our team. So I, I think it's it's awareness, right? It's like you have to see it, you can't turn it off. And I think that that even, that even speaks to how things change with, with um, Selma, with the bridge, right? It's that moment where it was live broadcasted that people were like, oh, oh, so, oh, I didn't really, I didn't really know what was happening to black folks in the South, in the South, right? Like it wasn't also happening other places, but if you can't turn it off, if you have to see it, maybe, just maybe you'll listen differently. And I say listen differently because I'm sure they, Everybody heard Colin, Colin Kaepernick, when he came out and spoke about why he was doing what he was doing, he was very clear. He was extremely clear. There was nothing about it that you could poke holes in, but people still just didn't want to hear it the way that he was directly stating it. So maybe they'll listen a little bit differently. Maybe they'll, you know, and, and this is component of the guys that are speaking up are great. LeBron James is a great guy. You can't deny that at this point, right? And so are you going to say that he's not great because he believes that his life is in danger and he wants you to recognize that it is too? Um, that, you know, it, it's bringing awareness and that's all I can say about that. I mean, I know a lot of us were like, but then the next day they were like, oh, we're going to keep playing. 
but then also money. So there's so many layers to this of, does it help, does it not help? I think it's reaching someone. And as professors, I know Professor Davis and myself recognize that a lot of times it's about who you can reach, not that you're gonna reach everybody, not that everybody's gonna go out there and do something extravagant, but that they might be able to have a different conversation, that they might say, oh, I never thought about that before. And so it's something. Is it the end all be all? No, but is it something? It's, it's something and I will take something from <laughs> over nothing. And uh, I appreciate our, uh, our athletes in this moment. And I appreciate the fact that they do have a collective narrative right now. And this is a very unique time. We, we will never, I mean, no, nothing like this has ever been seen before. And so I'm, I'm, I'm leaning into it and hoping and taking every positive out of it. Kind of like what Eric said with, with Nike, you gotta take the positive when it comes. Who it's coming from, I'll take it for now. So. That's what I have for that. I, I couldn't say much, I couldn't say better at all. And I think that Latoya, you, you summarized it so well. Um, I would only add one, one, one little note to it, which is the fact that the fact that the, 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 we're talking about it right now. Um, and you know, when this is tagged and marketed and sent out and posted up online, uh, someone will see sports in that title. And they may click on it, or they may sit and, and 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 really sit with us and reflect on what and how we got here, and what was the motivator, and why did those guys in Milwaukee? I was wondering why they did it, and so let me click on this video. And who is this Humanities Washington group, and who are these two people? And so you know, it gives rise to a voice that. Um, you know, I wouldn't have otherwise, and it gives opportunity for those of us who are faculty members and leaders in the communities of conversation to engage in conversations around, you know, what does this mean, folks? Um, there's no end all to this. I think that we all have to start to understand there's, this is a journey. Uh, this is, there's no end to this as much as diversity, equity, inclusion is just a continuation of growth and development. And sometimes we have these wonderful opportunities where pop culture icons or sports figures will provoke us in a way and prod us in a way and make us think in a way and, and have to really reflect on, wait a minute. Yeah. You know what? Why are we doing that? Um, and their leadership um is so appreciated for the generations that follow i think that when you have icons who people look up to and young people are wearing their jerseys and communities wear their jerseys that um and watch the games that we now have an opportunity to um shift the cultural voice of the generations that follow uh, allow for those of us in different, you know, in, in, in generations like, you know, mine and others uh, before me and, and, and uh, after me to just really think about, is this how we want to be? And that's why I want to really help people, help, help people understand as we, as we get kind of towards the end of this, this is about black bodies. Latoya, you said it several times and i want to reiterate it this is about black bodies and so it's great that you want to celebrate the black bodies that are out there performing at the highest level of athletic endeavor i'm i, I love sports i participate in sports but it just is so offensive to myself as a black man in society that you want to celebrate the black body when it's in um the entertainment of you and others in this society and not when they're being shot and killed or paralyzed in front of their children or in there is grief now that is going to be part of uh, the narrative of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and all of the other Ahmaud Arbery. There's things that we have to remember and sports and sports um, activism and protest is just a, a group of courageous folks who say, I'm glad you wanna watch me dribble this basketball, but I also need you to think about who I am and who are my people and who are we as a human group and as people collectively. And we gotta stop killing folks. We gotta stop shooting people. We have to stop shooting people, um, unarmed citizens of this country and anyone who can bring light to that 
and help us engage in these conversations, I'm all in. And, you know, I, and, you know, I appreciate the opportunity to share some time with you all. And I'm not saying that we're done, but I'm saying that I really want to make sure that point is made before we close. I, if I can just, At the beginning, uh, Langston, you, you, something you said clicked for me because earlier I was just, I wanted to triple check when, um, when uh, uh, Jacob Blake was, was shot, but I asked in my Google, when was Jacob Blake killed? Because he's not dead, right? And actually, I think it, it's almost like it's, it's, <laughs> it's ingrained in us to say that they're dead. Mm -hmm. And this is like that moment where they're not. And I, at the beginning, I was like, wait a minute, did he die? I had to triple check. I was like, did he die? Because like, it was just one of those things as in our American society that automatically we assume if you were shot by the police and you were a black person, you are dead. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's something different about the fact that he's still trying to survive that also might be permeating within us as African-American people. And then also George Floyd's brother, who looked so much like George Floyd that when you see him standing, you can't look. It's like the goat, it's like something's haunting us. It's different, it's a different narrative this time, I think, where we don't even realize, oh, he's still fighting for his life, he's still alive. And, and it hurts. And, and so as much as we were able to, in about an hour before this talk, candidly and openly about what it means, you know, for protests and black folks, black bodies and sports, it gets that moment where we get that heavy again. And I could feel it, Eric, when you were speaking, like, yep, and this is our reality. And uh, it, it's, if you're gonna love black culture, you gotta love black people. Yes. And that is what Eric is asking you to do because the, it's very, very clear that you love black culture, but don't love black people. And when I can go abroad for a year in Asia, and it's the first time that I see a black man on a building so high, and it's LeBron James is just like doing this thing over a Nike store, but I never saw it here in the United States of America. That made me question things, right? And then even when I went to a musical, a music store, and I went to the classical section, and jazz was listed as classical. There's those things where even on the outside, and I think this is where Black Lives Matter is branching because doesn't mean that people outside of the United States get our plight as Black folks, no, but they seem to love us and our culture a little bit differently than people within the United States does, and maybe they're hearing us. And so if you're watching this because it said sports, thank you. And I ask and beg you to listen to these three Black folks here who are sharing time and, 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 and work and, and, and knowledge that we gained and we had to strive through all our lives to get here with you to say, they're more than just athletes. They are human beings, they are citizens, right? And they deserve all the respect to be heard, um, to be listened to about what they are going through. And so I think I really am glad to have this space, to have this conversation, to meet with the two of you, to get this dialogue going. And I welcome people to take classes like yours, Eric, since you're doing the sports component. And maybe I'll get a pop culture one in there at Puget Sound, we're so small, uh, but I'll try and we might have a section on it. But uh, I do appreciate using that narrative to, to bring people in. And it always gets a couple of my student athletes to talk when I do talk about sports because they feel comfortable and confident to do it. And so I say, if you're gonna talk about sports, let's have a conversation about sports and race. Wow, no, thank you, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Brackett for mentioning Jacob Blake. It's like uh, black death has been so normalized as even become ingrained in my language. Thankfully, he is still alive. Thankfully, thankfully. Um, but I think that's a good place to stop. This, is, this has been an incredible, incredible conversation. Complicated, but incredible, about the intersection between uh, race, protests, and sports. Um, I'd like to thank our panelists, uh, Professor E, Eric Davis, and Professor Dr. Latoya T. Brackett. And again, I'm Langston Wilkins with Humanities Washington, and you can check out more of our work at www.humanities.org.